everyone for joining us today and to welcome you back to the next installment in our Ask the Auditor PCI Readiness Series. Today we'll, we will be discussing the penetration testing requirements under PCI, but before we get started, I would like to encourage everyone, if you have any questions throughout today's session, to please ask those using the Q&A feature, which is located on the WebEx toolbar. We will try and field those as they come in, and we will also reserve some time at the end for Q&A. So, to introduce you to Kirkpatrick Price, in case it's your first time attending one of our webinars, Kirkpatrick Price is a PCI Qualified Security Assessor, or QSA, and licensed CPA firm providing assurance services to clients worldwide. The firm has over 10 years of experience in information assurance by performing assessments, audits, and tests that strengthen information security and compliance controls. There are several ways you can connect with us, and I would encourage you to take the opportunity to do so. Uh, we have a very popular blog where we post regular industry updates and tips and best practices. So that's a great resource to keep connected with. Also, we have a library of recorded webinars. Um, all of our previous PCI webinars are on there, and we've kind of been working through the requirements one by one. Um, also, you should connect with us on LinkedIn to stay up to date with what we're doing and um, see, see what's going on in the regulatory compliance and information security world. Kirkpatrick Price provides a wide array of audit services and compliance assessments. Um, on the regulatory compliance side of things, we offer a lot of consulting services, such as policy and procedures development, risk assessment, vendor management, and internal audit plan development. We also perform readiness audits. And on the information security side of things, we provide guidance and audit services for a, a bunch of different frameworks, including PCI DSS, which we'll be talking about today, SSA 16, SOC 2, FISMA, HIPAA, and ISO 27001. I would like to welcome our first speaker today. Jeff Wilder has over 15 years of experience in information security. Prior to joining Kirkpatrick Price, Jeff was a trainer for the PCI Security Standards Council, where he was responsible for educating individuals working towards becoming a QSA. In his role of director at, of PCI services at Kirkpatrick Price, Jeff is responsible for all aspects of PCI services. And as you can see, he has several um, impressive industry certifications there. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to you, Jeff. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was a, a, a very nice introduction. Uh, once again, my, my name is Jeff Wilder, and I am going to be the moderator for this session. Uh, Jesse is uh, currently, for those of, that of you that have been to numerous of these events, Jesse is, uh, she's at conference this week, so uh, I'll be moderating it. We can go ahead and move forward to the next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about what PCI DSS is. I'm sure that most of you have a, have a very good understanding of what PCI DSS is about. Uh, however, we will be um, uh, uh, taking a little bit of time to, to look at some of the nuances uh, this week. Uh, one of the, uh, the changes that have happened uh, with the 3.1 requirement, there was, a re there was a, uh, what we call a sunrise date requirement. As of uh, July 1st of, of last year, there was a new requirement that caused every bit uh, has caused everybody a little bit of trouble. And so we thought we would take a few moments um, this week and discuss the requirement around developing a penetration testing methodology. So the PCI DSS is, was jointly developed by the, uh, the payment card brands uh, in order to help to maintain some of the, uh, or maintain the security of the credit card requirements. Uh, a couple of things to note, uh, as of this morning, the PCI Security Standards Council released version 3.2 of the PCI DSS. If you have not seen that, uh, that, that press release or if you've not been notified, version 3.2 is available. We're going to be spending some time here in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll have another webinar that we're going to spend some time and talk about what the deltas are between 3.1 and 3.2, okay? The PCS really is, once again, is going to apply to anybody that's involved in the payment industry. If you store, process, or transmit credit cards, you have to apply these standards, right? Uh, if you're a service provider, right, and you have the ability to impact somebody else's requirement, these standards apply to you as well. 
All right, let's go ahead and move forward. All right. So there's approximately 400 controls, uh, depending on how you count. Uh, in fact, this morning I was I was doing, running some numbers, um, and there's uh, there's approximately 400 uh, control objectives that that you have to look at. There's uh, uh, six domains and there's 12 areas. Uh, so so this week we're going to be, as I said, we're not going to take a deep dive into requirement 11 where the penetration testing requirements come about. However, we are going to spend a little bit of time in talking specifically about 11.3. All right, let's go ahead and move forward. So as of right now, uh, the last webinar that we, we presented, we talked about requirement eight. If you remember, requirement eight is about the authentication requirements. Um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be having another webinar on requirement nine, which is about physical security. Um, you know, from a hacker's perspective, if I have physical access to your device, uh, I can pretty much own the data that's on it. So we're going to talk about uh, what are some of the physical requirements and how that might apply to your environment. We'll also spend a little bit of time in talking about what are those areas where most organizations kind of struggle. Okay, so look forward for that. Look forward to that uh, that particular um, announcement. Uh, as when we put this together, uh, we May 2016. It was originally planned to release version 3.2, um, and actually this morning, as I've already talked about, uh, that, that that has been uh, published. Uh, there are numerous expanding requirements, and I'm, I'm sure that that uh, that there's going to be some of them where you as an organization are going to have a a, a great deal of questions about that. Uh, what we what we're going to do is put together webinars I've talked about to kind of discuss what those changes are, uh, and then possibly give you the opportunity to you know if you need to have those discussions to talk about how that might particularly apply to your organization. Okay, let's go ahead and move forward. Um, so let's talk about penetration testing. Um, there there was a requirement that that organizations um, when we look at the new requirement around three dot or, sorry eleven dot three. Uh, specifically 11.3.1, it said that your organization has to develop a penetration testing methodology. Now, what, what's interesting about this is, is that it's not really a policy, it's not really a procedure, right? It's really kind of both. And the intent behind this penetration testing methodology is, is to define the means and the methods by which a penetration test could be executed in your environment. So this isn't really so much a, you know, how to go in and hack your environment, but what are those things that a penetration tester needs to do in order for your organization to have a comprehensive test? Now, one of the things that you need to understand is this methodology is not something that the penetration, if you've hired a third-party penetration company, this methodology is not their methodology, right? This is your methodology that you own. And as you, as you engage these penetration testers and these penetration testing companies, right, you give them this methodology. And you say, when you perform a penetration test, this is the standard that, that you need to run uh, to, to perform a penetration test in my environment. And you'll find all of, those, all of that, uh, that documentation, or all of that, that requirement in the 11.3.1 requirement. The assessor is then going to ask for a copy of that methodology but then also going to take an opportunity to look at uh, the, the statement of work between the third party that you have uh, performing the test. Now, if it's somebody that you have performing a test in your environment, you're still required to have this penetration testing methodology, okay? So, so let's go ahead and start talking about some of the actual requirements. Um, all right, so 11.3, as we kind of already talked about the, this penetration testing methodology, and the majority of the, the organizations that we've interacted with thus far, um, they, they don't have this document, right? So um, there's, there's, we've got a slide here that I'll present some resources that you can use to start to develop that, okay? So you need to have a formal penetration testing methodology. Now, you need to execute the, the penetration test against this documented methodology, right? So it's not just, once again, it's not just a document that you put together for, for what I call audit fodder. It's something that, that's now a living, breathing document in your environment. If you do not have this penetration testing methodology, understand that that was a requirement that came about as of July 1st, 2015. So 
This has already been a requirement now approaching almost a year. Uh, if you don't have it, uh, I, I would recommend putting it together um, to making sure that the penetration test is then executed against the methodology, okay? So we have to have this, uh, this methodology. You need to execute the penetration test against that methodology, right? So you're going to provide that to the, uh, the, to the penetration tester. And, and it, it really needs to be comprehensive to meet all of the, 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 the 11.3 requirements. Okay? Let's go ahead and, and move forward. Now, once you have the penetration test done, okay, what, what the PCI DSS says is that any items that have been exploited need to be resolved, right? So you need to have a process to fix those items that have actually been compromised or those, those items that have been enumerated. Now, in a lot of situations, the, the, the penetration cluster is, is going to identify items, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those items were exploited. However, right, it, it's really not up to the penetration tester to tell you what needs to be fixed and what does not. So what occurs is, is that once the penetration testing is done, all of those items that have been exploited need to be resolved uh, according to 11.3.3. However, those other items that, that have been identified in your penetration test report feed into the requirement 6.1. Requirement 6.1, for those of you that aren't aware, Requirement 6.1 says that you as an organization need to have a process where you're identifying vulnerabilities, you perform a risk ranking process around those, and then you fix those that are considered high, urgent, or critical. So this is a situation where an, a penetration tester has found, uh, found some items, they, they've busted on some of them, right, they've actually uh, executed some of the vulnerabilities and gotten in. There might be others that, that are just, uh, might be a concern, right? Those need to feed into your 6.1, okay? So for PCI DSS, the penetration test is not considered pass or fail. The penetration test is an activity where you're looking to identify vulnerabilities within your environment. And really, the, the core purpose of this is to measure the effectiveness of your security program, right? It's, it's, it's a means by which you can identify, is our security program working? Now, you should never be surprised if you are doing the things that you need to do from a security perspective, you should never really be surprised by the findings in a penetration test, right? If, if you're surprised by things that come out of your penetration test, you might want to take an opportunity to look at your security management program and, and is it effective, right? Are we doing the, the things that we need to do to identify vulnerabilities? Okay. Let's go ahead and move forward. Okay. Now, one of the next things that you're going to have to do is if your organization uses segmentation to separate uh, your environment from what we consider the in-scope from the out-of-scope environment, this was a new requirement that, that we actually have to, to, to run a penetration test against that. What the, uh, what the card brands found is that there were a lot of organizations and a lot of assessors that would look at, you know, look at a network diagram and they would look at assets and they would say, okay, these are considered out-of-scope, but, but then when it came time to, to review these organizations because they had they had, been a, uh, they had been violated in some perspective from a, uh, a hacker, right? There were these boundaries that, that really weren't there, right? These barriers to prevent the bad guys from getting into your cardholder data weren't there. So the PCS Security Standards Council, along with the card brands, came out with a, a new requirement that says if you're using segmentation, right, the penetration tester needs to test that boundary. Uh, here in just a few minutes, I'm going to be uh, introducing one of our penetration testers, Sean, and, and, and perhaps if you have any questions, you can ask them about that, okay? Effectively, one of the new requirements is we're going to look to, to run a penetration test from the untrusted environment, try to get into your cardholder data environment in order to validate that your segmentation controls are effective. But Sarah, we can go ahead and move forward. Okay. So the penetration testing, one of the things that I would recommend that you do when you put this penetration testing methodology together, you need to make sure that you're covering the entire cardholder data environment, right? There's nothing in there that says you can't sample, but if you are sampling, 
That sample needs to be representative of the entire population of your environment. We need to look at the entire perimeter of your network. If you have four or five points of entry throughout, you know, the world to get into your environment, we, we would need to look to penetrate, uh, test all of those environments. We also need to have coverage for all of the critical systems. And really, when you look at the PCI DSS, there's a, there's a glossary. It says that your, your critical systems are really anything that stores, processes, or transmits. We need to look at getting from the corporate WAN, right, in, in, at, in, in attempts to try to access the, the, the cardholder data in an unauthorized way. We need to get from the, the, the Internet to provide to get to the Internet to, to get into your DMZ, to get into the cardholder data environment. Specifically what the PCIDSS says is that, that you have internal and external penetration tests. Okay, let's go ahead and move forward. So we've already talked about validating the segmentation is in place, right? And, and really the point of this is to, to validate that whatever controls that you have or if you are using segmentation to isolate your cardholder data environment, that those particular controls are, are effective. Now the next thing that we need to do is we need to look at having a penetration test done against both the application layer um, and, and the networking layer. And we need to cover all of those things that we would identify uh, from a web application perspective in the OWASP. And also, I would recommend looking at the, the common weakness enumeration, CWE top 25 known vulnerabilities. So we have the application penetration test, we have the network penetration test. Now, the other thing that we need to consider, and this is one of those new requirements, is that if there has been a known threat or known vulnerability within the industry in the last 12 months, it's required that your penetration tester actually test for those things. As I give an example, there was the Poodle uh, attack that, uh, that came out and the Beast attack that came out some time ago, and we're going to look to actually test against those things. All right, Sarah, can I go ahead and get you to go move forward? So here's a couple of resources um, that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that I would recommend that you can use. The, the, the standard, the TCS Security Standards Council says that you need to use an industry accepted uh, penetration testing standard to help to develop your methodology. And here's, a, here's a, a few of those that you might look to use. Okay. Let's go ahead and move forward. <laughs> Excuse me. So this methodology is going to define what is going to be done within your environment. Right, so, so it's not necessarily that you go down, uh, go out and download the NIST 800-115 document or download the PCS Security Standards Penetration Testing um, white paper that they released last year and say, well, that's my methodology. Well, that, that's really not a methodology, right? This document that you produce needs to be about your environment and, and what needs to be done within your environment, okay? Um, it's not necessarily, so, so just don't download it, uh, one of those documents and slap your cover sheet on it and present it to your auditor for a couple of reasons. One is that your auditor then is going to need to make sure that everything that's in that document was tested. So once again, this needs to be about your environment and, and how, to access, how to execute the test in your environment. What it is not is, you know, the commands to run in order to execute a penetration test, okay? That's not what this document is about. This is not how to go about executing the test, but it's what needs to be done during the penetration test. All right, let's go ahead and move forward. So I want to I want to welcome Sean. I'm going to let him uh, uh, introduce himself. This is the first time that he's been on one of our webinars. Uh, so, so Sean, welcome to uh, the presentation here. Uh, why don't you introduce uh, to everybody on the team a little bit about who you are and what your, your experiences are and uh, what you do for Kirkpatrick Price. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so as Jeff said, this is one of my first webinars with, uh, with Kirkpatrick Price, so I apologize if, uh, if, if things are, are a little uh, – uh, so I sound like I'm new to this, and, and there's a perfect example right there. Um, well, so a little bit about me. Um, I am the, the lead of the penetration testing team with Kirkpatrick Price, um, and, and so in that capacity, I, you know, work with all of our clients to, uh, to meet their various uh, security and compliance needs through penetration testing, vulnerability assessment, things like that. Um, I've been with Kirkpatrick Price for about four years. Um, prior to that, I worked um, with, a, with a, a contractor with the Department of Defense doing some, uh, some network defense type work. 
Um, I also have some some further further in my history some uh, some just various IT support types of uh, activity focusing uh, primarily on security. But um, that's a it's a little bit about me. You can see the uh, certifications I have here at the bottom. I don't want to focus too much on those, but uh, that's just a list of the certifications that I have to uh, give you some idea of, of uh, you know what, what's behind me, what what kind of experiences I've had, and that sort of thing. So, uh, well, so is, is that good so enough? Sean, to... that, Sean, how long have you how long have you been doing pen testing? Uh, pen testing, I, I actually started with Kirkpatrick Price, so, um, so yeah, about four years. Oh, very nice, very nice. Okay. Well, that, so that doesn't include. Ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say that doesn't include, um, you know, all of the the experiences I had prior to this that weren't technically pen yeah. testing, but uh, but the security related work on the defensive side that, that really yeah. sort of goes hand in hand. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, sir. If we can go ahead and let's move forward then. So, so we have a couple of questions for you, Sean. Um, you know, what the, and these these come out of numerous questions over the years that I've been asked, right? You know, I'll, for, from an assessor perspective, I'll look at a penetration test report, and you know, there's been times that I've had to reject it because it wasn't a good penetration test. So I thought I would ask you, right? What what makes a penetration test good or bad, right? What is what are those things that from from your perspective as the actual person running a penetration test, what's the criteria that you would use to define whether or not this is a good test? So so if you could go ahead and give us uh, you know ten, five or, or ten minutes on the slide, let's go ahead and have that conversation. All right, so uh, let's just pop to the next slide so I can give the high points for everyone that's here. Um, but, but essentially, uh, you know, we're talking about. Well, I'm going to start here with the, the bad bad pen test. Um, as a pen tester, you know, these, these are things that I, I want to, you know, strive to do better than, obviously. And this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just general things that, um, that you as, as, as the client of a penetration testing firm should, should expect to, uh, to steer clear of. And the first is just the classic um, glorified vulnerability assessment. And essentially what that is is, um, you know, you've hired someone to do a penetration test for you. They, they spend about a week in your environment. You're, you're maybe not quite sure what they've done. Um, but, but at the end of the process, they, they give you a spreadsheet or a, a Word document that looks uh, very similar to something that you're used to seeing on a quarterly basis for PCI clients. And that is, uh, it, it's essentially just a vulnerability assessment report. Um, may, maybe it's directly output from the, uh, from the tool. Maybe they uh, put a little bit of color on it, but essentially you're, you're seeing the same information. And, and, and really, that, that doesn't pass for a penetration test. Um, it's just missing a lot of Excuse me. A lot of a lot of elements that you just won't get from that fully automated vulnerability assessment approach. Um, and, and there's there's you know no man in the middle, no no hands-on activity, no manual effort to um, to identify these vulnerabilities beyond what you know what that 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 software told you. Um, so just really that's that's the classic example of just a, a bad pen test. Um, and another thing, this, the second point here is just just making sure you know it, when we're talking about what makes a bad pen test. It's easy to have a bad pen test when you have someone who is not qualified to perform a penetration test. Um, that's you know, a, Sean, that's a, that's a really good point. So, so talk to me about, you know, from from you know the, the people that are sitting on the phone call or on the webinar here, how do they know if the person that that they've engaged is, is actually qualified to to perform the test? I mean, it's it's easy once it's all said and done to say, well, the, you know, it's obvious the person wasn't qualified because the report that they gave you wasn't good. But how, how can yeah. they how can they measure that up front? Yeah. So what I would do is you know uh, as you saw on, on the last page there there's several um, certifications that I have that that sort of speak to the, the training and knowledge that I have in my background. Um, but but generally speaking, um, you know organizations such as SANS, Crest, um, uh, the the offensive security uh, companies like that are are really putting a lot of effort behind making sure that that professionals that are you know part of their um, you know their organizations are, are up to date with with current attacks, current uh, you know trends and things like that. And so um, I, I would I would encourage you to you know to look at their background, look at their certifications, um, and, and just do some research on your own about what those actually mean. Um, because you know as as every industry has, there, there are a lot of a lot of credentials that are flying around that that really don't have a lot of weight behind them. And the same thing exists in the security world. Um, so you, you know when you see someone who's SAN certified, someone who's OSVP certified. Um, those sorts of things add a little bit more weight behind uh, what they're already telling you. You know that they at least have a baseline of knowledge in, in the security space. 
So, so when the next bullet point you have here is unsupported scope definition, right? Is 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 that something that the the penetration tester should be doing, or is that something that the the client that you're working with should be doing, right? Defining yeah, so, the scope. Yeah, absolutely. So the scope is is not for the penetration tester to define explicitly. Um, however, the reason that I mention it here um, is is that it's sort of twofold. You know, one is obviously the client needs to make sure that, that scope is right right up front. Um, and, but, but your penetration tester should be able to help you identify any gaps in that scope if it's obvious that there are some. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the, the time that most people realize the scope was not quite right um, is when it's too late, when they're providing that to a third party who is responsible for making sure that, that they're adhering, in this case, for a PCI rock. Um, the QSA may look at that and say, okay, well, you know, based on everything else that's going on in this in this this audit, we see that that the scope for this penetration test is just not quite right. So it does start with the client, um, but there are definitely opportunities for a penetration tester in the process of reviewing the methodology and in the process of reviewing um, network sure. diagrams, things like that, to to help um, you know clear that scope up. And and it sort of ties back into the last point: if they're not qualified, if they if they're really not prepared to help in that way. Um, it, it's just not going to end well. Absolutely. So, so is this something that, as a penetration tester, that you would look to find within the penetration testing methodology that we've talked about, what the scope of the environment is, and perhaps you know what the qualifications need to be of a penetration tester? Is is that something as a as a as a penetration tester that you look for this type of information in that that methodology? Yeah, so the methodology definitely should speak to to what their expectations are of the professional that's doing the job. Um, and, and then, and on the scope side, I mean, I, I think that's that's key to the methodology is understanding that that scope for you know internal, uh, external, and web application as it applies. Uh, just understanding where where testing should start and where it should end with respect to scope. So, absolutely, I think that should be very clear from the methodology. Yeah, and of course, the, the last bullet point that you have there is you know the poor documentation. So, so how would you recommend that that somebody knows before they get a bad report, right? That they have poor documentation. How how can how can a, a, an organization that's looking to have a penetration test done, you know, what are some some methods that they can use to making sure that they're going to get good documentation? Yeah. So uh, I would recommend that you know when you're working with a, a new organization, someone you haven't done a pen test with in the past, that you uh, that you the first thing you do is is request a scrubbed report of some kind. Um, specifically, if you if you know what the the scope of testing is going to be on your end, then then you want a report that that closely reflects the reality of your organization. Um, at, at the very least, you want just a good representation of what they provide as deliverable. Um, and and my, my point behind poor documentation is just that you know th there there is an opportunity for an organization to do a great job, a pen test organization, to do a great job on the penetration test, and yet still provide del a deliverable that the client is then told is a bad pen test. Um, so, so when you're when you're looking at that that deliverable they provide you as an example, um, you just need to make sure that it answers the questions that your methodology is is really creating. Um, so so is it is it going to based on what you see in their scrub report? Is it going to answer you know be able to cover the scope you need? Is it going to the te depth of testing going to be you know enough to um, you know to to satisfy what's you know what's spelled out in the methodology? So. Um, all those things need to sort of be able to. You should be able to tie those back to what you're looking for based on what they provide as as a uh, a representative example of their documentation. Very good. All right, so let's go ahead and move forward to the to the next point. Um, yeah. All right. So and again, this is not a, an exhaustive list either. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about each of these points. But um, so so the, the first point I have here is, is just talking about the approach that's used. Not, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with the the three common approaches um, for penetration testing. Um, the first is is a, a white box approach, and that is all information is, is out in the open for the penetration tester to review. Um, and and that's, I say that maximizes the value because um, with, with a white box approach, you can spend the most time on the most critical you know aspects of the penetration test, as opposed to spending more time in an information gathering or reconnaissance um, sort of activity prior to being able to dig deep into the critical systems. Um, but but to just just for I guess point of definition is a gray box is a little bit less than that. You you, you just get a base idea of what the what the environment looks like. Um, you might get some some details about the network, but but it's not going to be an in depth um, you know, dive into the network or the uh, the structure of of, of things. 
Um, and then a black box is, is what everyone thinks of as the, the hacker's approach, is, is, is knowing nothing more than, than a client's name, which in, in the case of um, looking for a good pen test is, is most times going to be the, of the least value just because of the nature of it and, and the legalities behind um, pen test teams, um, you know, have, having to confirm things and spend just a significant amount of time on, on, on the information gathering side prior to ever being able to put any work on, you know, actually testing your security. So once again, this is this is based on typically, you know, you'll find that information within the methodology. Right? Yeah. So, so talk to us about, you know, your bullet point here that it demonstrates risk beyond vulnerability identification. What what does that really mean? Yeah. So like like you mentioned before, the you know during a penetration test, there are going to be a lot of findings where things were not exploitable. Um, you you have some you know markers that that indicate that there you know there's a vulnerability in the environment, but you weren't able to take it that that next step, um, you know, to, to to really give them a strong indication of why this is significant in their environment. Um, but when that's not the case, when when you you know when you're in the environment and you're able to, for example, find password hashes or or, or you know clear text passwords or or something that will allow you to take a, the next step. Um, when we're looking at a penetration test, a good penetration test is going to take that next step. You're not going to stop at, oh, I, I, I gained access to clear text passwords. Um, but you're going to attempt to use those against critical systems, against networking infrastructure, you know, in order to try and get deeper into the network and show them, you know, it, w without gathering, you know, sensitive data necessarily, but, but be able to show them just how far a real attacker might be able to take this to really drive home the importance of this in their environment as opposed to just saying, oh, we have clear text passwords, end of story. Um, you know, I, I just think it's important to make sure that you are, you know, you're digging in beyond just saying here's the base vulnerability. So, so effectively, you're, you're, you're painting a picture of what the real risk is within the environment so that these organizations can, can measure that and, and make business decisions based on what the penetration tester has done. Is that, is that really kind of a fair assessment? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide here. All right. And we so, to talk to, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to go ahead and, and give you the floor to, to talk about this. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, this is just my, my final point on, on what makes a good or a bad pen test. And, and ultimately, you know, uh, I, I say you, but really the, I, I, my, my point here is that in the end, it's up to you to make sure that the product that you're paying for is, is what you need, you know, for, in this case, PCI. Um, and, and so this, this you, put, you might not be able to see the screenshot here very good, but this is just, uh, this is one thing I wanted to show everybody. It's, it's a, a a checklist is provided in the penetration testing guidance from the uh, PCI Council, and essentially what it allows you to do is take the deliverable, and in this case it could be the actual deliverable from a penetration test, or it could be that scrub deliverable that I mentioned before, um, and you can compare it against this checklist just to get a baseline idea of, you know, does this meet the requirements that, that PCI is giving us guidance toward? Um, you know, does, does it include the credentials of the tester? Does it include the contact information? All the other various pieces um, that are included in this checklist. Um, just, just to give you an idea of, of, at a baseline, is this thing giving me what I need? So, um, so yeah, the, the, the end product, it, it's up to you to make sure that it, that it makes sense for what you're trying to accomplish, and, and this checklist can help you with that. Okay. In this document, for those that, that would like to have a look at the, the, this particular source of this document, you can find that on the PCI Security Standard Council's website, and I, and I believe the name of the document is the Penetration Testing Information Supplement. So if you go to their, their document library and you can do a search for pen testing uh, or pen test, this, this document will come up. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So what are the things that you're going to look for during your, your testing phase? Yeah, so um, if you just advance one more slide, I'll, I, again, this is just the high points here I'm going to talk about. But um, essentially, um, any penetration test, the, the, the very first step, um, you know, beyond doing your standard scanning and, and, and host discovery and those sorts of things, is going to be to identify and exploit what, what we typically refer to as the low-hanging fruit. Um, and, and that's going to be any of those sort of issues that, that are just too easy to pass up and things that, that anybody, even with relatively little skill, are going to be able to exploit. 
um, and potentially gain, you know, access to sensitive information systems, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, some examples obviously would be, you know, default passwords on, on networking devices, on, on um, you know, operating systems, deployed uh, applications, things like that. Um, and, and other sort of, you know, configuration issues that, that we as penetration testers and, and other, you know, hackers and things will, will, will be well aware of and take advantage of first. Um, and then from there, we move on to investing up, uh, excuse me, investigating opportunities to chain vulnerabilities. Um, so some of these things that come out of the initial, you know, vulnerability scanning phase, things like that, may not at face value seem that important when they stand alone. Um, however, when you combine those with other vulnerabilities, it can, it can become more significant. Um, and, and one example that I always like to give is, is for example, in a web application um, assessment, you might find one vulnerability where you're able to read arbitrary files on a, on a system, which is significant by itself, um, but it's mostly a blind sort of attempt to find information on that system. Well, you, you might get lucky and, and, you know, somewhere else in that application you find an error message that will display a, you know, a particular directory that maybe you had no knowledge of before. Um, well, when you combine those two things, you then have the ability to, you know, to grab files off the system, and using this other vulnerability, you can, you know, determine, what, you know, where sensitive files might be. Um, so when you combine those, it becomes significantly more, you know, um, you know, requires more effort, and 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 realizing that that thing is is a little bit more significant than we thought before. Um, so so just those ability to chain vulnerabilities, and again, that goes back to having someone who is, uh, you know, who is well-versed in penetration testing to, to make that determination and, and take that next step. Um, and and I, I don't necessarily need to cover all of these, but, but the, the next two sort of go hand in hand. So, um, you know, when, when you're doing a penetration test, there's always gonna be that opportunity um, to, to review more network traffic that you might not otherwise, otherwise be able to see, specifically on the internal side in this case, um, and, and just get some more information about, um, you know, what, what kind of communications are going on internally, what, what, what sorts of protocols are out there, um, you know, communicating, and, and, and what can you do with those. SNMP, um, WPAD is another good example, the, the web proxy auto detect. Um, you know, those are things where, you know, you can get some, some clear text information that might lead to further attacks. Um, just based on being able to sit and listen to that traffic and, and eventually, um, you know, find a, find a vulnerability that might allow you to do a man-in-the-middle sort of um, scenario. And then the last point here, which is, which is, is really, um, you know, the most important, I'm not sure why I put it last, to be honest, is, is I guess it's sort of a workflow sort of situation, but um, pivoting through additional network systems, networks, devices, and systems, and, and, and the idea there is, you know, we will say from vulnerability assessment, we identified an exploit that allowed us to, to get access to just a, a general workstation um, in a particular environment. Um, you know, that, that, that is not necessarily significant to every organization. They might not necessarily care that you got access to one of the workstations because it's not a critical system. Um, so from there, we would then try and pivot. So, um, you, know, in a, you know, typical example is maybe we would run um, a, a tool called Interpreter that, that will allow us to grab, you know, um, um, encrypted but reversible encryption passwords out of uh, Windows memory, um, and, and then use those passwords to gain access to another Windows machine that might eventually lead to an opportunity to, get, to gather uh, domain administrative credentials or, or just other information by pivoting through the network. Yeah. Um, so Sean, that's, that's Sean, really some of the Sean, high points. Sean, one of the things that I would ask, right, is is when you're running a penetration test, would it could it be expected from from the client perspective that you're going to be able to find everything in their environment? Um, not necessarily. Um, it, I mean, it depends on the protections that are in place. Um, and, and I think you're speaking generally. I'm not really uh, entirely sure, but but it's essentially. You know, the, the restrictions that you have in place in your environment could limit some of the, you know, our ability to test certain systems. So we, we may even very well know exactly where they are, where they are in your environment. Um, but if you have strict ACLs in place, um, say, between two network segments, um, it's very possible that while we know it's there, um, we, we may not be able to identify, uh, you know, an avenue to get directly to that device right. in order to perform additional testing. Does that answer so so it, is, it is possible then at the end of the test, while you might have done a, you know, owned, you know, the, the administrative credentials by the end of the test, but there still may be additional vulnerabilities that weren't discovered as, as part of the penetration test. Is that, is that, yeah. is that what I'm kind of interpreting you saying there? 
Yeah, I think that's why it's important, you know, and, and, and I guess I can't speak uh, entirely authoritatively, uh, authoritatively, excuse me, on this. Um, but, but in the case of, of PCI, you know, the, the, the quarterly uh, vulnerability assessments that, that are performed are really, in my opinion, you know, a way to, to identify some of those gaps that might exist because they have, you know, as, as the client, you have more access to all the systems here environment than we might as a penetration sure. test. So um, there are opportunities during the penetration test to work with a client, and if the client is willing to, we can we can take steps to get access to those systems. But but yeah, there's always going to be the chance that um, you know that we aren't able to identify things, whether it's because of time, because of you know the technical realities of the project. Um, Surely, yeah. So so once again, kind of going back to the penetration testing methodology, right? These pen the penetration testing methodology could be established, right, to, to define what those expectations around, you know, making sure that, 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 that the penetration tester is testing for, for pivot attacks and man-in-the-middle attacks and, and really, you know, looking for the, where those opportunities are even defining those chain vulnerabilities. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we did talk about before that, that, that the methodology doesn't necessarily need to speak to how to execute those, but at least, um, you know, at a high level saying that, you know, if you had the opportunity take it and, 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 you know, here's success uh, criteria yeah. for that particular sort yeah. of approach. Absolutely. All right, so let's go ahead and move forward if we can. All right, so so I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you, uh, Sean, once again, to go ahead and to talk about the, the, the what are the steps and the phases during a, a, a penetration test. Um, and, and for those of you that aren't aware, when we're looking for a penetration testing methodology, we're looking for, you know, specific attributes assigned to each one of these individual phases, right? What is required in your environment for each one of these six phases? Uh, and those are the typical attributes that we look for during a PCI DSS assessment. So, Sean, if you could kind of talk about what those six phases look like. Yeah, so um, so these, this is just sort of a generic breakdown of phases here, and, and, and you wouldn't necessarily be looking for this exact set of phases from, from a different organization. Um, this, is, this is how the practice price, um, you know, breaks down the, the testing phases. Um, but, but just, just to, to get started here, the, the information gathering phase is, is, is not an active testing. This is, this is a, you know, pre-engagement phase. This is where we really, we gather your methodology, we get, gather your network diagram, um, and, and all the information we need to, to get started with the penetration test. Um, I listed here as a phase just because that, that's really the, you know, the bare starting point before we do any sort of, um, you know, engagement. Um, then the next step is, is reconnaissance, and this is where, you know, we take the information that you provided to us. Um, and, and we begin to use open source, um, you know, technology or uh, uh, resources to try and gather more information about your technology, about your, um, you know, the people that work for your organization, and other information that might allow us to gain a, a stronger understanding of, you know, how you operate, um, you know, what sort of information, you know, is available. Like, excuse me, this is my voice. Um, what sort of information is available externally, and that sort of thing that can, that can then improve how we approach your environment. Um, the, the next phase here is discovery and scanning, and that is it's exactly what the name, you know, suggests. We're, we're attempting to discover systems um, in your environment, and, and this is, again, active testing at this point, um, and performing uh, scanning for um, available ports and services once we have identified the actual active listening hosts. The, um, the the next phase here is the vulnerability assessment, and that is the uh, that's where again, like I mentioned in the bad pen test example, that's where some organizations stop. Um, but but this is where you know it's a, a fully automated approach um, to identifying, uh, you know, just a, a very very wide and and deep range of vulnerabilities that are that are known that have you know uh, uh, signatures associated with them, that sort of thing. Um, and, and that's really the baseline where we start to, to take a look at, at, you know, what's exploitable in your environment, the sort of low-hanging fruit that I mentioned before. Um, and then we move into exploitation, and that is, again, that's a generic term I'm using there. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean exploit code, um, but it, it's really all of the activity that goes into attempting to, um, you know, to, to breach the security of your environment or, or you know, any, anything that I mentioned before during the active testing phases. Um, and then the, you know, arguably the most important part, since we're, we're on this subject, is, is the reporting. Uh, and it really has to do a good job, as I mentioned before, of speaking to um, everything that's been done during the penetration test and, and making sure that it adheres to, to the methodology that you, um, you specify 
and, and that, um, that it's really going to drive home, you know, all of the testing that was done and, and, and make sure that there's a clear picture of what that, what that environment looks like. Um, and then an un unlisted phase here is obviously the, the potential to, to go back and form remediation checks and things like that. So, um, but, but we don't necessarily need to talk about that. All right. Let's go ahead and move forward. So, Sean, talk to us then about, you know, what, what's the interaction that, that uh, an organization should expect with their penetration tester, right? Is, what does that relationship look like? Is it just somebody that, that uh, you know, that shows up one day, runs a pen test, leaves, and two weeks later they send a report? Or talk to us what, what a client should expect when they're interacting with the penetration tester. Yeah, so the, um, the, the, the first, you know, example you gave there is, is that's actually very typical and, you know, it's not something that you would expect, but, but as my first point here, um, you know, you set the expectation. You as the client with the penetration testing team, you want to set the expectation for, um, you know, for how you guys are going to communicate during the penetration test and when you expect to see, um, you know, any sort of, you know, communication from the penetration tester. Because as a penetration tester myself, I can tell you that, um, if you leave me alone to perform your your uh, your project and 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 we don't have some expectation of communication, I'm going to dig in and I'm going to I'm going to go deep. I'm going to I'm going to focus and you might not hear something, <laughs> and and that's not good. You know that's not a, that's not a good way to approach things. And and so the expectation up front that that project price sets is that. Um, you, you know, we're at the very least, if you have no other requirements, we are going to give you an immediate notification of significant issues. Um, and, and then everything else is really is, is really up to the client. You know, how often do you want to communicate with us? What do you want to know? Do you want daily status updates? Do you want us to call you at noon and then again at end of business? Um, obviously, we don't want to get into the point of, you know, micromanaging a pen tester and, and expecting, you know, up to the hour um, updates. but. But you really do set that expectation, and and when you're invested in the penetration test, as this last point uh, you know um, talks about, is it, it, when you're invested in it, it, it gives you the opportunity to identify issues much you know much sooner and begin to take action on those, um, as opposed to the example you gave of the pen tester takes your information, they go to a pen test, they come back, and then you're hit with a bunch of surprises that you need to start working on. So, okay, very good. Well, let's go ahead and move forward to the next slide. So talk to us a little bit about the difference between, you know, the different frameworks, whether it's HIPAA or PCI or, you know, whatever the reason for the penetration test. What's the difference between, you know, what should be expected in the penetration test itself? So, I mean, obviously every every framework has its own, you know, specific requirements. And, and so when we're talking about from one framework to the next, obviously we have to, we have to identify what the realities of that framework are. Um, so, so when we're, like, for example, in, in PCI, there are obviously, you know, specific required activities we need to, we need to accomplish. Um, so we, we need to make sure that we're speaking to those. Uh, we need to understand what success criteria is for that particular framework. Um, and then what the documentation considerations are. Because uh, believe it or not, there are some, you know, some pen tests that I've done where, where the documentation is, is just, you know, give us a spreadsheet that, that, you know, that is all the issues we need to address. Now, it, because of our standard process, we have a narrative report that they get, but that documentation is really all they wanted was, was a spreadsheet with all the facts. Um, so it, it, the, the way that we approach it really depends on that, but, but as the second point here that I made is, you know, there, there are some things that are going to be common to all frameworks. Um, you know, so the, the basic phases we talked about before, um, common attack scenarios, which I, I touched on some as well, and then, then best practice recommendations. I mean, when we finish a report for really any, any framework, uh, it's important to make sure that we're giving you the best advice, regardless of what, you know, what is required for documentation on that. So um, we make sure we have the high points for the particular framework, but then we also want to make sure that, that you are getting what we believe to be security best practice, you know, even if it's not necessarily in, in disagreement with the framework, but maybe just, a, you know, a separate, uh, um, you know, bit of advice that you might not otherwise get. That makes so once sense. again, this is something that the organization can cover in their penetration testing methodology. Well, even from the PCI, pers PCI DSS perspective, it's a required document. They can cover many of the other requirements and framework issues within that penetration testing methodology to make sure that they can get one test that, that really covers all, right? 
Would that, would that yeah, be a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely. Just just making sure that that the you know the the most prescriptive uh, framework is 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 focused on, and that the others are are you know sort of fit within that. Um, and then call out any you know specific areas where they might differ, just to make sure that that the, all the bases are covered. But yeah, that's that's really possible. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So, what's the difference? You know, when specifically when we look at the PCI DSS, it says that that you have to have an internal pen test and an external pen test. What what does that really mean? So, I mean, at, at a basic level, uh, when we're talking about an internal penetration test, we're, we're talking about um, you know access in, into the environment that is 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 not externally facing. It, you know, it, it includes all the systems that that are you know behind a firewall, you know, inside of your network perimeter. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's really sort of, you know, as, as my little quotes here um, are trying to, uh, to drive home, it's, it's sort of the area where everyone thinks that, uh, that all their systems are safe. Uh, unfortunately, that, that, that's sort of the view that people have on the internal side is, is this is safe from hackers, this is privileged users only, um, and, and it's really more wide open um, and, and, and unfortunately a lot of times less well protected. Um, external, on the other hand, is, is that, that area where, you know, this is externally facing. Everyone is, you know, you know, their goal is to make sure that they're tight externally, that they have, um, you know, very specific firewall rules that, that are, you know, limiting access, you know, into their internal environment, that they're patching regularly, that they're monitoring and doing all the things that they need to because they're watching out for hacking. <laughs> um, so, so the the you know to the to the the, the overall question that, that's you know posed on the, on the uh, the slideshow the or presentation here, the idea is that um, you know that that w there are absolutely uh, you know a lot of different uh, activities that that can be performed internally that that won't necessarily get you anywhere externally, and it's and it's, it's because of that distinct difference that people see when they think externally, they think oh danger, let's let's tighten it up, let's watch out for it. Um, but, you know, they come in the internal network to kick their shoes off, sit back, you know, watch TV and, and maybe forget the patch. Maybe, they, uh, maybe they're not paying so much attention to what ports and services are running and that sort of thing. So it really opens up a lot of opportunities. I mean, when you, and when you think about, um, you know, common, common hacks that have happened recently, you know, th th a lot of those happened from a, a uh, social engineering perspective. You know, they, they were able to get some sort of code execution on a system that is internal. Um, and, and then all those perimeter defenses were were basically bypassed. So, um, so yeah, that, I mean that's that's really my breakdown on internal versus external and, and, and the uh, the realities of, of those two perspectives. You know, I think so. For, from the assessment perspective, I, I just kind of want to cooperate what you just said. From an assessment perspective, you know, I find that companies are really really good at or you know fairly pretty good at, at hardening their outside firewall rules, right? The, the rules coming in from the internet, but you know, they're, they're pretty lax when it comes to hardening the outbound rules. You know, do you ever uh, have the opportunities or do you ever test for exfiltration of data or is it just once you've compromised a system, you know, you, you kind of figure, well, I own the system, there, there's no point in further testing. Is that something that, that, you ever, that, that you ever have to do from an internal external perspective is, is actually making sure that the controls to prevent the data from leaving are, are, have been appropriately established? So, I mean, that, that's something that could definitely be, um, you know, provided as a as guidance in their methodology. Look, we want to make sure that that our uh, data data exfiltration exfiltration protections are are you know operating effectively. So, um, we want to do this as part of the penetration test. Um, I, I will say that I, you know that I agree that a lot of times when we're talking you know about a penetration test um, internally, the, the outbound rules are, are are wide open in most cases, unfortunately. Um, you know, and, and that's because it, you know most people don't think about the the you know the value to an attacker to have wide outbound access. I mean, it gives you you know just just really too many opportunities to be able to set up command and control for various malware and and things like that, and be able to easily communicate based on you know that internal device being able to beacon outwards, basically on, on any port they want to. Um, and, and with that comes the fact that, that most people are not just going to be monitoring every single port outbound as well. Um, and, and so it really gives an opportunity for, you know, for attackers to, to be able to, 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 to gain, you know, a foothold through the, you know, the other types of attacks that I talked about, then really to maintain it through that outbound access and the ability to, uh, to communicate through that. Awesome. 
All right. So, so Sarah, are, we're at a point now where we're at the end of our deck. Uh, did we have any questions that were posed to uh, to Sean? We do. Um, we have a question here. Uh, is there a time and place for a black box engagement? So, I mean, I think the answer is yes, but when we're talking about PCI, uh, and, and, you know, Jeff can speak a little bit to this too, but I, I think it's kind of, it's frowned upon because it, it, there are too many opportunities to miss things. Um, and and the, the reason for that is that, you know, black box, if you do it in its truest form, is knowing nothing more about a, com you know, a, a company than, than their name. Um, you know, everything else that you do in, in you know, in, in attempts to attack them is, is, is blind. Um, you know, in the case of a, a paid penetration testing engagement where it's black box, there's obviously going to be some more communication there because, uh, like I said before, the, the legal requirements. I mean, as, as a company, Kirkpatrick Price is not free to attack anyone they want. Um, so there has to be some, some communication with someone in the organization to, uh, to, you know, to get the go-ahead to continue. Um, so, so in PCI, I, I think it's, it's, it's not a good idea. Um, but there definitely are times where it might be appropriate, um, it, given, you know, there's enough control around it to make sure that uh, there's no collateral damage. Um, I, I think that's probably the uh, best answer I have right now. Yeah, you know, as part of that, what I would say that, you know, it, it, typically a black box test, it doesn't really add any value, right? Because the, the point of it is during penetration test is that you want to enumerate as many vulnerabilities and as many issues as possible. You know, and when you're paying for either the resources from an internal perspective or you've hired a third party to help you with that, is there really any value in just having them, you know, do all of the discovery and spend days and, and sometimes even weeks in discovery that, that you're paying for that, that you can provide that information up front and save that cost uh, as part of the, you know, the, the, the engagement? You know, one of the other things to consider is during the penetration test uh, is that there's opportunities for making sure that your incident response program is working. You know, if the penetration tester is in there and they're knocking on doors and they're opening ports and they're doing things, your, your, your logging and vulnerability management uh, solutions should be going off like a slot machine, right? So there, there might be an opportunity for a black box Test, you know, to making sure that your incident response program is working effectively. So, Sarah, well, did we have any more questions? Very good question, by the way. Yes. Um, can you recommend any resources for expanded web application testing techniques? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. Um, I, I don't think I got to it um, earlier in the conversation, but, um, you know, the, for PCI, I believe it's 6.5.1 or 6.5.2. And if I remember correctly, uh, essentially that they have some some you know best practice um, application checks that that should be done. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times what happens is people don't um, focus on those, or they focus only on those, and they don't they don't expand beyond that. So uh, a lot of those come directly from the OWASP Top 25, um, and and so when we're um, when we're talking about expanded web app assessment uh, checks, the the OWASP testing guide is an excellent source. Uh, it includes some really, really good um, example, you know, uh, attack techniques and then examples of the, how those attacks work, um, which is which is useful for both a penetration tester and for, um, you know, a client that's trying to, to um, consume a penetration test that they just received. All right. Well, we want to thank everybody for spending some time with us today uh, in, in talking about penetration testing and talking about the penetration testing methodology. Uh, if, if you're not a, a, uh, um, a customer uh, of Kirkpatrick Price, it's quite okay. Uh, and you have any questions or, or you, you know, have just general questions, even if you are a client of ours, you know, please feel free to reach out to either myself or to Sean. Our, our phone numbers and our email addresses are here on the, on the presentation. Please feel free to reach out to us. And, you know, if you have any questions or need any help, we're more than happy to assist you in any time or any place that uh, that, that you could need. Uh, the next uh, presentation that we're going to have is going to be May 18th, and we're going to be recovering or covering uh, Requirement 9. Um, the the uh, Just as a plug for the one after that, we're going to be talking about the deltas between PCI DSS version 3.1 and 3.2. Uh, so spread the news on that one. That one's uh, typically those those presentations are pretty popular. 
Uh, and we look forward to uh, spending some time with you uh, the, uh, the, the week of May 18th. Everybody have a wonderful day, and we'll see you soon.